Um, the speaker for the third plenary is Professor Dan Karitskis. Professor Karitskis is the Harriet Ryan LB Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has published extensively on antiretroviral therapy and drug resistance in HIV infection. He previously chaired the AIDS Clinical Trials Group and served as a member of the NIH Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council and the US Department of Health and Human Services Panel on Guidelines for Antiretroviral Therapy. He is going to give us an update on new antiretroviral therapies. Thank you, Professor Kariskis. Thank you very much, Denise, and thank you, uh, Professor Prapan and the committee for inviting me to speak at the 22nd uh, meeting. It's really a great honor to be here. I'm going to give you an update on uh, some of the new drugs that are being developed for antiretroviral therapy, so we'll be looking now into the future. Uh, let me begin with my disclosures. I consult for several of the companies involved in the development of these drugs. Now, we know that there are uh, more than 30 different entities uh, that are currently approved by the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration and by many other regulatory bodies around the world uh, for the treatment of uh, HIV infection, and these fall into various classes. The, uh, the uh, drugs listed in black are approved for initial therapy as well as subsequent lines of therapy, and the ones shown in the lighter color are approved only for the use either as uh, switching uh, therapy or in treatment experienced uh, patients. So one could well ask, given the wealth of drugs that uh, we have and their extraordinary efficacy and generally good uh, safety and tolerability, uh, do we really need more drugs? Uh, the current uh, regimens that we have are highly effective. They're generally safe and well tolerated. They're uh, all or nearly all once daily, so highly convenient as single tablet regimens. Uh, and particularly with the uh, advent of drugs like dolutegravir and bictegravir and with the boosted protease inhibitors, they have high barriers to resistance. But there are still concerns that persist, and these concerns regard the long-term and unanticipated toxicities, who would have thought that, that integrase inhibitors might be associated with uh, substantial weight gain, for example. Uh, there's the desire for even less than daily uh, dosing in terms of uh, frequency. Uh, and there are lingering concerns about the emergence of resistance. The, the, the world is about to embark on an enormous experiment of switching from a favarins based to dolutegravir-based therapy, as you just heard from uh, uh, the previous speaker, and uh, ha what that will mean in terms of potential for emerging drug resistance, especially in uh, lower income countries where switches may occur without appropriate virologic monitoring, uh, is something that is of great concern to the WHO and other bodies. So there's always the need for, for new drugs, and in particular for the, the need for longer acting antiretrovirals. These would allow for less frequent dosing uh, that could improve adherence to, uh, uh, to, uh, to these regimens, and it could improve the effectiveness of, of uh, antiretroviral therapy. Because with less frequent dosing, the uh, potential to provide drugs as directly observed therapy becomes much more of a reality than if you need uh, uh, daily dosing. Uh, and so there are several different approaches that are currently in development, and I'll focus my talk on uh, these three uh, drugs uh, this morning. Uh, these include the use of uh, injectable cabotegravir and long-acting rolpivirine, uh, islatravir, uh, which was previously known as MK8591, which is a novel class of drug known as a, a, nu a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, and the uh, novel uh, class of uh, capsid inhibitors, uh, GS6207. I'll speak on Friday as part of my talk on managing drug resistance about some of the other newer drugs that have either been recently approved or are awaiting approval uh, as uh, viral entry inhibitors. So let's turn first to a discussion of long-acting cabotegravir plus rolpivirine. Both of these drugs have been uh, formulated as nanoformulations that allow either uh, subcutaneous or intramuscular uh, administration, uh, uh, leading to very long half-lives of these drugs. And you can see here for cabotegravir, uh, the scale here is in weeks, 
that uh, in the open uh, figures, um, the uh, in intramuscular injection, which is what's been moved forward into the phase three trials and is now pending FDA approval, that with uh, injection, you can have a half-life that lasts for uh, 26 uh, weeks. And uh, so this is after a single injection. Uh, with rilpivirine, here you see with multiple injections, you can sustain uh, trough concentrations that are substantially above the uh, uh, protein-adjusted uh, EC90 uh, at uh, monthly intervals. And so based on these data and based on the um, LATTE series of studies, uh, two large phase three studies were uh, organized and the results of those studies have uh, been presented and I'll summarize them for you here. The first of these was the ATLAS study. And this study uh, looked at uh, participants who were already on a suppressive antiretroviral regimen. That regimen could have comprised uh, any of the major classes, protease inhibitors, non-nucleoside RT inhibitors, or integrase uh, inhibitors, along with a two-nucleoside backbone. And the uh, uh, candidates were randomized uh, equally to either continue on their uh, already uh, prescribed therapy or to have a, a four-week lead-in of orally dosed cabotegravir and rilpivirine in order to exclude the possibility of any hypersensitivity reactions, because once you inject the drug, it's very hard to remove it. Uh, and then if the drug was uh, well tolerated, then after four weeks, they switched to monthly injections of cabotegravir and rilpivirine with a 48-week endpoint, uh, after which in this extension phase, uh, all the participants were offered the opportunity to uh, continue with uh, monthly dosing uh, of um, uh, cabotegravir and rolpivirine or to uh, uh, receive the drug every other month uh, because uh, additional data had suggested that uh, uh, once every other month dosing might be just as good as every month uh, dosing. This slide shows the primary and secondary endpoints of the study. As a switch study, the primary endpoint was really the number of failures that occurred, and then the secondary endpoint was also the uh, overall uh, success of maintaining virologic suppression. And so here you can see that uh, in the primary endpoint, uh, there was essentially no difference at all between, uh, in the failure rate between those who remained on their uh, previously prescribed combination antiretroviral regimen and those who switched to the injectable cabotegravir and rolpivirine, uh, meeting the non-inferiority margin. And in the secondary analysis, uh, looking at the su success rate, you can see that between 93 and 96 percent of participants maintained virologic suppression. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, was uh, likewise met the non-inferiority margin, and so uh, th this uh, study was a substantial success. If we look at uh, adverse events, uh, the uh, regimens were, were well tolerated. There was, uh, uh, in terms of any adverse events that occurred in at least 10% of participants, there was some upper respiratory infections and nasopharyngitis, uh, some, some headache. Uh, and as far as drug-related adverse events were concerned, uh, there was a little bit of uh, fatigue, pyrexia, uh, headache, and nausea in the injectable group uh, compared to none in the continued group. These were people who had been tolerating their regimen for many months already, and so it's not surprising that there were no new uh, adverse events. Very few participants had adverse events that required withdrawal. Now, the big question with uh, this form of therapy, of course, is how well tolerated were the injections? And this slide summarizes the uh, injection-related adverse events. Uh, you can see that there were nearly 7,000 injections given uh, during the uh, study uh, up to the primary endpoint, and that approximately 20% of these injections were associated with injection site reactions, the main uh, uh, adverse event being that of pain. That, uh, so about 83% of the adverse events associated with injection were, were local pain at the injection site. Uh, it was much less common for there to be nodules or uh, swelling, uh, uh, sort of a true uh, 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 infuvertide type injection site reactions. Uh, and uh, notably, the uh, duration of these uh, reactions was only uh, three days uh, as a median, and uh, only uh, four per participants withdrew from the trial as a result of injection site reactions. 
The partner study was FLAIR. This study had a slightly uh, different design. Here, uh, uh, treatment-naive participants were recruited into the trial, and they were initially placed on a regimen of dolutegravir, abacavir, 3TC as a fixed-dose single-tablet regimen, and those who achieved full virologic suppression uh, could then be randomized to either continue on that single-tablet regimen or switch to oral cabotegravir and rolpivirine for a lead-in uh, period, after which they then received the injectable, and again, uh, with the primary endpoint at 48 weeks and follow-up uh, to 96 weeks. So here there's a direct comparison between injectable cabotegravir and orally dosed dolutegravir. Like the ATLAS study, this study uh, met its primary endpoint of non-inferiority, uh, showing that uh, there was, uh, again, virtually no difference between uh, the arms with respect to the rate of virologic failure uh, and nearly identical rates of uh, uh, maintained virologic suppression at 94 and 93 uh, percent for the uh, orally dosed and injectable arms, uh, meeting the uh, non-inferiority endpoint. Uh, I won't uh, summarize the safety data from FLAIR, which looked almost exactly like the ATLAS data for the sake of time, but want to highlight some uh, rather curious uh, findings with respect to uh, virologic failure and resistance. There were six participants in this, uh, between ATLAS and FLAIR uh, who had virologic failure and developed resistance to cabotegravir. And uh, curiously, uh, all six of these individuals are, uh, were people who have uh, a subtype A virus. Uh, but it's not just uh, any subtype A, it's actually an A6 isolate. Um, these uh, slides show this as being an A1 isolate, but that's actually uh, incorrect. A more careful uh, sequence analysis uh, confirms that these are actually A6 viruses, the viruses that are, or the subtype that is uh, predominant in Russia. And you'll notice that five of the six individuals here are uh, of uh, Russian nationality. There's one person in France who had an AG uh, recombinant virus. And uh, what is uh, particularly striking is that uh, it, the A6 uh, subtype has as a uh, um, polymorphism at, at baseline a uh, substitution at position 74 uh, in the um, uh, in, in integrase gene, and all of the viruses in which resistance occurred uh, carried this 74 uh, substitution. You can see there's a variety of resistance mutations in integrase that uh, emerge at the time of virologic failure, including the 155 mutation here, a one, uh, and then uh, here a 148, a 140, and another 148. It's not yet un understood uh, what the role of the 74 polymorphism is, if it has any role at all in potentially uh, enhancing the emergence of resistance. The 74 mutation by itself has no effect on susceptibility to cabotegravir or other integrase inhibitors. And in collaboration with uh, Aviv, our laboratory is now uh, attempting to uh, analyze whether there is a fitness advantage of viruses that carry the 74 mutation that promote the emergence of other resistance mutations. Uh, there may be other factors involved uh, in the failure, including um, uh, body mass index. Several of the participants had uh, rather large body mass indices, and whether drug was appropriately delivered intramuscularly as opposed to subcutaneously. Uh, all of the individuals who had uh, virologic failure uh, had uh, drug levels that were in the lowest quartile uh, of, uh, of drug at the trough, but uh, there were many other people who had similar drug levels who nevertheless remained suppressed. So there's a lot to still understand about these virologic failures. Uh, this, drug, uh, th this drug combination is pending FDA approval. It was expected to be approved by the end of uh, December, but uh, approval was uh, upheld because of some uh, uh, regulatory concerns around uh, uh, manufacturing issues that need to be resolved, and so hopefully uh, that will happen in the current uh, first quarter of this year, and we'll see uh, this agent approved uh, relatively soon. Uh, another long-acting drug that is uh, further behind in uh, development but is now uh, uh, has just completed phase two and is moving into uh, larger expanded trials uh, is the uh, uh, NRTTI uh, islatrovir uh, that uh, has previously been known as MK8591 and EFDA or a final uh, 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 
fluoronyl deoxyadenosine. This drug has actually been around for a very long time. It's been studied by uh, Mitch Mitsuya and Peter Sarafianos and Mike Parniak uh, for uh, uh, nearly 20 years, actually, uh, but had been uh, put aside uh, when there was a lot of concern around toxicities of uh, the um, uh, uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, uh, particularly because uh, this was a, a, a fluorinated uh, version of, uh, of these drugs. And, yeah, um, islatravir is, uh, has two unique properties. One is the presence of this ethyl group, and the other is the fact that it actually has a three prime hydroxyl. So this drug is not a chain terminator in the classic sense. It can uh, uh, ac accept another uh, nucleoside, but it prevents the reverse transcriptase from moving along the template, uh, and therefore is called a translocation uh, inhibitor. Uh, it is a highly potent agent with uh, IC50s in peripheral blood mononuclear cell culture of uh, less than one nanomolar. Whoops. Uh, oh, I mentioned doravirine in passing here. This is already an approved drug, and I bring it up only because the uh, phase two study of uh, islatravir is done in combination with uh, doravirine, a next generation uh, NNRTI that has a unique resistance profile, is not an inducer or inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 system, uh, and can be dosed once daily uh, without regard to food. This slide shows the uh, design of the uh, phase two dose ranging study that uh, combined islatravir with doravirine. Uh, ideally, this would have started as a two drug study, but the FDA insisted that the study begin as a three drug study and then allowed a switch to two drugs once uh, participants were virologically suppressed. So in this trial, the comparator arm is a fixed dose combination of doravirine 3TC and the TDF formulation of tenofovir, and then the uh, uh, experimental arms uh, looked at three different doses of this latrovir, uh, initially in combination with doravirine and 3TC, and then after 24 weeks dropped the, the uh, lamivudine and continued for the next 24 weeks with uh, islatravir and doravirine alone, again compared to the three-drug regimen. And the plan being after week 48 to move forward with a selected dose uh, uh, for uh, an extension phase uh, during maintenance. This slide shows the virologic outcomes at week 48 by FDA snapshot analysis, and you can see that between uh, 77 and 90 percent of the uh, participants uh, achieved and maintained uh, virologic suppression. Uh, uh, there were slightly more failures at the highest dose of uh, uh, islatravir, but these numbers, given the relatively uh, small sample size, are not uh, statistically uh, significant. And here you see the uh, log drop during the uh, initial 24 weeks and then the s sustained virologic suppression out to uh, week 48. In terms of uh, adverse events, uh, there were relatively uh, few. Uh, th uh, there were no deaths. Uh, there was a single serious drug-related adverse event which actually occurred, uh, uh, that resulted in discontinuation that actually occurred in the uh, doravirine 3TC tenofovir arm, not in the islatravir arms. Uh, two participants in the highest dose group of, uh, uh, for islatravir discontinued uh, due to AEs, one uh, for GI side effects and uh, another who had reactivation of hepatitis B virus infection. Uh, and there were somewhat more uh, drug-related AEs in those who uh, were receiving doravirine uh, compared to those at any of the doses of uh, the investigational drug uh, in this trial. Um, this uh, is a duplicate, I apologize. So how might this drug be uh, administered? Well, uh, islatravir in these studies was given orally, and it is being investigated uh, for potential weekly oral dosing. But a much more exciting approach is to provide it as an implant. And here you see an example of uh, uh, implants as they're currently used for long-acting contraception uh, with implantable uh, uh, etonogesterol. Uh, and this is the size of the implant, and the implant uh, is an automated uh, device that uh, can be uh, uh, done uh, by um, uh, allied uh, healthcare professionals, doesn't need uh, a surgical implantation by a, a physician. And we heard at the Mexico City meeting last summer uh, preliminary data uh, looking at 
the pharmacokinetics of Islatravir uh, in uh, seronegative uh, uh, study participants who received one of two doses, either 54 or 62 milligrams of Islatravir as a single agent. And uh, here the orange lines, the heavy line shows you the, um, uh, the average uh, intracellular is latrovir triphosphate concentration. So this is the at concentration of active drug during the 12 weeks that these uh, implants remained in place. And the dotted lines show the uh, minimum and maximum of the range. And then you can see at the higher dose, uh, everybody even at the minimum was well above the uh, threshold of uh, 0.05 picomoles per million cells, which is the uh, amount needed to assure virologic suppression. And in modeling studies based on these 12-week data, it's projected that at week 52, one year of having the implant in place, uh, you would still have concentrations of drug at, at about uh, uh, 0.076 picomoles per million cells, which is a uh, uh, sufficient drug to inhibit uh, HIV replication. Now this uh, by itself would be an astonishing advance for prevention. You would need a partner drug in order to create a regimen in order to be able to have an implantable uh, antiretroviral regimen, but the possibility that we could be giving uh, implants once or twice a year to sustain virologic suppression uh, is really now only a couple of years off. The last drug I'll speak about, which is uh, yet again a little bit earlier in clinical development, but moving rapidly forward, uh, is the uh, capsid inhibitor uh, GS6207, which uh, thus far does not have an official uh, chemical name. And just to uh, remind you about uh, the function of HIV capsid, uh, capsid is what we, uh, we also know as uh, P24, uh, the major uh, protein of the virus particle itself. Uh, the capsid self-assembles uh, during the process of, uh, of uh, virus production uh, and then has to disassemble upon virus entry. And the capsid inhibitor uh, binds to the uh, capsid monomer in a way that both prevents the assembly of the capsid and prevents its disassembly. And that's important because it means that the uh, drug acts at several different stages in the virus life cycle. It interferes with capsid disassembly and therefore interferes with nuclear transport of the capsid uh, uh, reverse transcriptase uh, uh, and uh, integrase complex uh, following reverse transcription of the, and the double-stranded DNA into the nucleus so that integration cannot happen. Therefore, capsid acts on early stages of the virus life cycle, but it also prevents virus production by uh, inhibiting the appropriate formation of the capsid. And so it has the capacity to, to prevent uh, production of virus from cells that are already infected and, and therefore is unique in this dual uh, uh, function in the, in the virus life cycle. A phase 1B study was uh, recently reported uh, at the Mexico City meeting and uh, updates uh, presented at uh, the EACS meeting in Basel uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, this study uh, examined the activity of three different doses of uh, GS6207 given as a single uh, subcutaneous uh, dose. Uh, and uh, after uh, pa patients were followed or participants were followed for 10 days after which they all switched to a fully suppressive regimen in order to sustain the virologic suppression without risk for emerging drug resistance. And you see here in this slide the uh, slope of the viral decay, uh, which showed a very nice uh, dose proportionate response with um, a, a more about a two log decrease being achieved at day 10 uh, in the highest dose. Uh, this is a really very a potent uh, agent when, if you look at uh, the amount of uh, drug that's being uh, given here. The, the um, safety data are still blinded, uh, but looking at the uh, blinded data, there were some injection site reactions, uh, not very surprisingly, and some uh, upper respiratory infections, a little bit of nasopharyngitis, uh, but all of these adverse events were grade one and two in severity, so at least in this small preliminary study, uh, there were no serious adverse events and no discontinuations uh, due to uh, adverse events. So I mentioned that uh, there are other drugs in development. Uh, uh, actually, ibilizumab, which is a novel drug, is approved, and I'll say a bit more about that on, on Friday as part of the management of uh, patients with extensive drug resistance. 
Uh, Fostemzivir uh, is another uh, entry inhibitor uh, that uh, is pending approval. Uh, Liranlimab, uh, which has been around for many, many years as Pro140, uh, is likewise pending approval uh, and in preclinical development is a maturation inhibitor uh, that uh, is yet to enter into clinical trials. So we really have remarkable promise for new agents that uh, have the potential for revolutionizing our approach to antiretroviral therapy. And I think that as, uh, as successful and as uh, 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 incredible the advances have been with once daily single tablet regimens, being able to look forward to uh, the advent of injectable or implantable therapy uh, offers uh, enormous uh, opportunities for both prevention and treatment uh, going forward. And I expect that these agents will be approved uh, within the next uh, uh, three to five years uh, and for carbotegravir rilpivirine in the next uh, uh, three to five months. So let me end there and thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll, um, I'll give the floor back over to uh, Denise. Thank you.